Good evening and welcome to another episode of Backyard Farmer. I'm Elizabeth Killinger filling in for Kim as she takes a well-deserved break. We've got another great hour planned for you, including answering your gardening and questions. Give us a call at 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln or toll free 800-676-5446. Emailed questions and JPEG pictures can be sent to byf at unl.edu and we'll answer them on future shows. We need to know as much information about your question as you can give us, including what part of the state you live in. And Backyard Farmer is available during the week on our social media networks, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So to start the program tonight, let's take a look at some samples. And Jim, hey. what do you have for us? Well, good evening, everybody. Um, say Jolene from Ottawa, Iowa, sent these into Backyard Farmer, and so I have them in hand. And I thought this would be the neatest thing to show to, on tonight's program. When you look at these, these tend to look like uh, paper. And Jolene, when she was looking at her lawn, there were grackles in the lawn, and they were pulling up these out of the lawn, and so this little flat, papery-looking stuff was there, and so she wondered what it was. Well, here's the, here's the common name question, that, or the common name that won't last too long. It's called the cigarette paper webworm, and this is the webbing they create in their burrow in the ground. Now, if you want to get more technical, it's the grass tube worm, but I like the cigarette one better. <laughs> So anyway, these are kind of like a, a burrowing webworm that, that feed on the turf, but they're of no consequence, really. They're more of a curiosity than anything else, so don't worry about them when you see them. But the birds, I'm sure, were very fascinated by this. This was really cool. Looks like the birds got a lucky strike. Uh, they must have rushed oh, hell-mell in to get them, you know, all right? Each bird must have pulled up a pack a day. Can you imagine? So anyway, that was just, uh, just a curiosity, but they're really cool because we hardly ever see these in the world of entomology, and you can't reuse them and make cigarettes out of them. Sorry. <laughs> Equally gross and entertaining at the same time. Okay, Rock, you got to top that now. Well, I think they look more like zigzags, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, the weed I have is prostrate spurge, which many of you have seen on the show. Um, I've shown it before, as of some of the other people. But the bottom line is, is that right now we're seeing a second flush of growth with that we uh, regermination. So if you put down preen or something like that in your um, ornamental bed or even in your lawn, you're starting to see some, especially in those thin spots in the lawn, and it's going to require some um, removal. But if we can get in really close, we've got seeds that will arise out of the axles right there. That's going to be a seed pod that gets produced there. And right now, they're, even though this one is probably only a couple weeks old, this time of year with the long days, they're popping seed out like there's no tomorrow. So if you're going to physically remove them, which is fine, because they do pull up, pull up relatively easily, make sure you physically take them off the site, especially in an ornamental bed, because that seed can mature even when it's, after it's pollinated, even, even after the plant is pulled. So you're going to have these seeds in and around there. And if you've got a a continuum. This is actually out of uh, one of my wife's ornamental beds, and it, they're kind of getting away from her. And I, I'm not sure why, but because we did put down a, an application of pre-emergence, but they um, it got away. It's a late germinator, so perhaps we put it down a little bit too early. But that's prostrate spurge, and like all the spurges, you can tell what it is mm -hmm. by the oozing uh, white uh, sap, and it's a uh, close, uh, closely related to both poinsettias and um, leafy spurge. That's a noxious weed in most of the range ground. Well, thank you, Rock. All right, Kyle, what do we have there? Uh, here we have Astra Yellows on uh, hot papaya cone flowers, so uh, Echinacea. And if you see the kind of green that's popping up out of the top of the out of the top of the bloom, that is the actual. Um, that's the um, the deformed flowers is caused by this Astra Yellows. Astra Yellows is a bacteria-like organism. Um, that can infect over 300 different species of plants from over 30 different families, including both carrots and potatoes. Unfortunately, there's not really any good, any good control for, for Astra yellows aside from roguing it out. So if you are seeing symptoms like this in, your, um, in any of your foliage beds, then you'll, uh, now is the time to just go and pluck them out as best you can to prevent the spread from moving to, um, moving to the other plants. All right. 
And that hot papaya is really fun because it's one of those that has the, the dual. Oh, it's beautiful. It's really <laughs> cool, but yeah, something to be on the lookout for. Yeah. And Jeff, what, what do you have? Oh. <laughs> I need to wait. Hi, it's all right. <laughs> so oh, it's <laughs> Elizabeth will be back later. <laughs> We have um, Bottle Brush Buckeye. So this is a favorite shrub of mine. And um, interesting enough with this particular one, they can get quite large in a sunny location. So they can get, you know, maybe in the nine to 10 foot range pretty easily. Uh, and in sunny areas, they've already gone through their flowering. They're starting to set uh, seed right now. But in areas where it's shady, and this particular one is in a shady location. So I have, I have about five at home. And the ones that are in shady locations are now just starting to flower. So I've kind of been having flowers from these plants now for a few weeks, so which is kind of nice. But in shadier locations, it's quite a bit smaller. It's about in the five to six foot range. So anyway, but it's a fun plant. It's easy to grow from seed. Uh, that's what I've done with all of these. So, um, and they're very long lived. I, they have been at the Chicago Botanic Garden. They've been there for, for a long, long time. And ours on campus have been there for at least 30 years, so. It's super fun, and I like the long bottle brush yeah, flowers yeah. on there. It looks kind of like a little mustache going on. <laughs> uh, so now it's time for picture questions. Yeah. And Jim, you have the first one. Okay. So we have a person from Omaha. They saw these little insects on their balcony, and they were just wondering if somebody could identify it for mm -hmm. them, what those are. Okay, that's called the eyed elator, or the eyed click beetle. And... Uh, they're kind of a wireworm-like larvae that feed usually in dead wood and uh, rotten trees, those kinds of things. But they come out about this time of year, and you notice they have kind of a mimicry going on. When uh, they're out in the broad daylight and are active, they have these two eyes that tend to make them appear like they might be a snake or something like that. So that's a, that's a form of mimicry that just helps to sustain the, the numbers, you know. And they're called click beetles. The click beetles, because if you turn them upside down, you know, they'll wiggle their legs for a while and then, then pop, you know, they'll, they'll try to right themselves by this little spring-like uh, thing in, that's in their body. So it's always, it's always fun for kids to watch that. <laughs> and adults, too. Yeah. No, I've watched them before, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so, Rock, you get the next picture question. Um, so what this viewer has is they have a picture that they think has migrated out of their garden. Um, they've tried pulling them, they've tried spraying them. It doesn't seem to stop them from spreading. Neither does digging them out um, or planting grass and, and replanting them. So they want to know what they can do to stop this. Well, I, and I mean, looking at it, it either it looks like a lily of some kind, day lilies or something like that, and, and they probably have them in that bed. You can see that there's a, it's on top of the wall in this particular picture, so it's invading, as they said, from the yard. And, and lilies, um, day lilies and other lilies can be especially invasive, and even some of the herbicides that you would normally use to control what you would think would be a broadleaf in the lawn aren't going to work very well on these particular ones, and you're going to have to be persistently spraying them down to keep them out. And even when you throw some more seed back in there, they're rising from those rhizomes and underground runners, and they're gonna pop up time and time again. I'm not gonna suggest they go into the bed, although you know, you're know you supposed to divide the lilies on occasion. I'm thinking maybe that's something that they need to think about doing and back them off from the edge of that bed, because they're gonna to continue to creep under the wall and come up. And so maybe Jeff can add to that or subtract from that, but I, uh, they're gonna have trouble controlling them and, and exclusive of removing them out of the bed they invaded from, which I'm not sure they're gonna to wanna to do, they're just gonna to have to either tolerate or, or um, be real aggressive with hand removal and the use of something that's non-selective. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think you're right. Yeah, short of going in on the other side of the wall and kind of shearing them off, taking a long tile spade and going in there and kind of doing that. But clearly they've they've grown underneath there, so they're becoming their own plants at this stage. So they can they can that's why they spread and take over large areas. So so good luck. Is yeah, what we're saying. Right. <laughs> Enjoy them. Enjoy them while you can. Why not? Uh, Kyle, your next picture question is a zucchini plant that this viewer has on their patio. Earlier in the season, they got some really nice fruits off of them, but in the last few weeks, the fruits have started to become disformed. They want to know why um, it's happening and what they can do to help get some nice zucchini fruits out of it again. Hmm. Well, uh, the two pictures might be a couple different things going on. Um, you could eat, one of the things could be just poor pollination um, with the um, zucchini flowers, the pollen is only, only active for about a day, and so if we have a lot of wet periods, um, the bees and other pollinators will avoid those flowers, and then they, um, that really decreases the, the amount of pollination that we get. 
The other thing that we could be dealing with there is blossom end rot, and that's uh, mostly a nutrient deficiency. And so just a proper fertilizer program should take care of blossom end rot. All righty. Okay, Jeff, you've got the next picture. We have an Iowa viewer that has some endless summer hydrangeas. They were planted about four years old. And as you can see from the picture, two of them have turned kind of a yellowy, greeny kind of color. Mm -hmm. And then the other two um, look somewhat normal. They're just wondering what could potentially be going on or some things that they can do to fix it. You know, the the macrophylla, so the, that uh, large leaf hydrangea, lace cap hydrangea, are very sensitive to high pH. So, uh, and while two of them are looking all right, um, my guess is that that's probably our, our issue right there. So, what you could do, you know, the, the things I would suggest is the plants look relatively healthy, especially the, the larger one that's a little chlorotic, is uh, pull the mulch back and see if we can incorporate some alum aluminum sulfate in there, and you can get that at the at your garden center, they have that. So try incorporating that into there. The other thing would be is um, look at adding some compost, maybe an inch or so of compost to the top. So again, we're just gonna try to lower the pH. And like Rock has told us in the past, it's a, it's a constant battle. I mean, you're, you're doing a little bit to a sea of high pH soil. So um, you're gonna have to do that on a regular basis. All right, so try to change your pH and hope that they Yeah, agree. and it's just something you'll have to stick with. Every, you know, every year I would say you're gonna wanna incorporate a little bit in there just to keep the pH down. All righty, well, thanks, Jeff. Nebraska is celebrating its 150th birthday with a public art project called Nebraska by Heart. Several of these heart-shaped sculptures have been placed around both city and east campus, and Kim took the time to tell us about them as well as the beautiful heart-shaped plants. We talk a lot on Backyard Farmer about art in the garden and the garden is art. And of course, we come at that from many perspectives. The fun part about the garden is art is the plant material, the layout, the lines become the piece of artwork. What we have in Nebraska right now to celebrate the 150th birthday is a project called Nebraska by Heart. It is a statewide public art project. 83 of these beautiful big six foot fiberglass hearts are a temporary installation in Lincoln, Nebraska, around the Haymarket, downtown, the Capitol, and both city and east campuses. The other neat thing about this particular project is if you think about it and its temporary nature, and you wanted to do something in your own landscape, whether it's commercial or residential, you choose a piece of artwork, it has some fond memory for you, it has some tie to a piece of your family history, and more importantly, maybe it ties to plant material. Our frog heart is one of the funkiest ones and very colorful and a great spot to start talking about some of the plants that have hearts in them or hearts in the name. Of course, common bleeding heart is known by most people. This is actually one called gold heart. So the foliage is beautiful in addition to the hearts. Fewer people are familiar with one of the fern leaf sorts of bleeding hearts. This is one called Fire Island and it blooms obviously more continuously than the big one. Clearly bleeding hearts get their names because of the bleeding hearts. Then we have things like Brunera. The foliage itself is heart shaped and this happens to be one with the name of Silver Heart. There's also one called Sea Heart. So here we go with that heart sort of theme again. If you really don't want to use perennials and you want annuals, of course, they come out every single year with different fun names. One of the ones is this year is a double petunia and it's called Valentine. Well, of course, Valentine, Nebraska would be all over this one and it's the right colors, even if it isn't heart shaped. This is a dahlia. This is one called dreamy fantasy. So think in terms of your heart, put these annuals in your landscape bed around your heart sculpture. If you wanna do really permanent plants or you wanna think in terms of trees and shrubs or other things, hostas have heart-shaped leaves, ginger does, red buds do, lilacs do, even lindens. There's a little bit of a stretch to looking like a heart-shaped leaf. That's a fun project celebrating our state's birthday, and you can have fun trying your hand at growing one of those heart-shaped plants that Kim talked about, too. 
So here we go with our second round of picture questions, Jim. Good, good, good. Those are always good. So what we have is we have a Spencer, Nebraska viewer. They have an ash tree. Mm -hmm. The leaves have started to curl, and they also have some branches that they call look like they're full of scabs. Mm -hmm. So they want to know what it is and what they can do to treat okay. and if their tree is going to survive or not. Yeah, if it's an ash tree, ultimately <laughs> it may be doomed in the landscape. But, uh, it might be a question of years yet. Um, the branch, first of all, has what looks like oyster shell scale, and that's a hard, sh hard shell scale. It's very small, and of course, the covering to the scale is shaped like an oyster shell. So that's why it's called that. Now, oyster shell scale overwinters on a number of different deciduous host plants, trees, and shrubs, as the eggs underneath that shell. So the first opportunity was missed to control it, and that's when the eggs hatch out underneath the scale shells in May. And then, uh, so right now, there's no really no window that can be used to, to treat for that. But uh, there usually is a second generation toward late July, early August, where again, eggs that were, are created underneath the shells hatch, and then the little crawlers move outward from that area onto new portions of the plant. So at that point, you could really spray the tree if you need to. Um, you know, with insecticidal soap or, or even a horticultural spray oil if it's not too hot. But anything like that with a bit of force and you can dislodge a lot of those crawlers and minimize the population of those. The other one where the leaves are all curled is, is leaf curl ash aphid and the reason why it curls is because the aphids are infesting the tree as the leaves are unfolding so they're always going to stay curled through the whole season. But leaf curl ash aphid is now gone, and so all you have is just the relics of uh, what, they, what happened when they fed. They've moved to another plant, and they won't be back until next year. So don't worry about uh, leaf curl ash aph aphid. They're gone. So one we don't need to worry about, and one the timing's not quite right. Right, right. Oh. August. Wait Early a little bit August. longer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rock, we have a viewer that has a weed in their flower garden in Omaha, and it just started to bloom and they thought it was a flower. Somebody tells them it's a weed. They can't find it in their weed guide, but it's spreading very rapidly. So they would like to know what they need to do. Well, it's, this is actually a desirable plant, at least in my eyes, it's sweet pepper bush. Um, the flower will become white and, and spike-like. It's really kind of very pretty. It gets its name from sweet. It's got a sweet aroma and pepper because the seed pod looks like black pepper. It's mm -hmm. not, doesn't have any value in terms of a, of a condiment on your food or anything. But um, I actually would try to save this plant if I could. And when they say spread, it you know, can be fairly aggressive. It's a fairly aggressive shrub, but it's not you know, I'd, I'd be curious how it got there, whether there, there's a neighborhood one that has them. But I'm going to actually flip it over to Jeff and say if they wanted to move that, what would they do? Well, at this stage, I guess I would um, I would wait till fall if it's something they really had to get out. I mean, this is obviously not the time of year to try to move anything. So I would look at doing it in the fall, or if they want to kind of plan where they're going to go ahead and, and put it, um, then they could wait till early spring, so before it starts leafing out again. Well, thanks. So Jeff, they've got I, a little bit of time here. But if they do want to control it, it's going to take, um, you know, some uh, pulling it up is probably. They'd have to be aggressive and they can do that, but if they don't want to pull it up and they want to hit it with something, any of the non-selective should knock it back. Um, just be careful with the surrounding plants that you're trying to keep. But a spade would get rid of it as well. Mm -hmm. so. That's what I said, pulling it up. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I mean, but if it was big and That aggressive. was my first suggestion. Yeah, okay. All right. okay. I'm not a nozzle head all the time. <laughs> And moving on, Kyle, <laughs> you've got the next picture. What we have is we have a viewer from Lincoln, and they planted a peony last year, um, last fall on the south side of their house, full sun, average soils. They followed the instructions on the packet. They thought they knew what they were doing. Um, they didn't expect much this first year, and that's exactly what they got. So they just want to make sure, you know, is it looking okay? Is there possibly something pathological going on? What, what's going on with that? Well, there might be um, a, a fungus that is kind of attacking the lower leaves. Uh, it could be botrytis is one of the one of those fungal pathogens that that can can infect the lower leaves. Um, the other other thing though is it could just be having some issues rooting, and so uh, there may just be a, a minor crown rot or something like that. Honestly, I wouldn't do anything with the plant just yet. I would probably just watch it um, and continue to to water it well, and just hope that next year it's looking a lot better. So just a wait and see kind of approach. Just and wait see and what see. Happens. All righty. So Jeff, 
Um, this one is a viewer that had a volunteer mulberry tree under the bush, and what they did is they did the cut stump treatment, but they used Tordon to help control that mulberry tree. And because it was dry, they turned the sprinkler on underneath the bush um, shortly after they did the cut stump treatment, and then they see that the red to it dogwood is starting to have some death in there. Right. They're just wondering if it could potentially be Tordon that has um, taken some of that bush out of there, or if they need to replant, if there's going to be any issues with residual, um, if they choose to replant. Well, I think uh, theoretically it certainly could be toured on, and to turn it back over to nozzle head over here, uh, <laughs> <laughs> toured on's longevity is significant, right? It, in the it soil. Is, I mean, it, it depends on, I mean, I don't know what kind of rate they put down on a cut stump. It's generally the ready to use formula that's very high concentration. And then, you know, it rained or they irrigated, I can't remember mm -hmm. what you said. So it washed off in pretty pure concentration. So that hits the soil and then it's got long soil residual. Um, some people have gone to the point of using activated charcoal and incorporating it to try to deactivate the, the tort on as well as other herbicides or other pesticides. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, this is a wait and see as well. I think I, uh, red twig dogwoods by their very nature are really sensitive to tordon because any, any of the colored bark species of woody species are very susceptible to tordon and we don't know why that is. We just know that it is and a red twig dogwood might suffer but if they see it dying back a little bit more, um, you know, they may want to consider adding some activated charcoal or physically digging out the soil and then replacing it with a untainted soil. But I, I'm, I'm gonna guess that looked like tordon injury in that in little small picture and I'm with Jeff that there's a, probably the potential for some injury. And this is not something I would have recommended. I'm not a big fan of Tordon in the mm -hmm. garden. And you wouldn't, I mean, at this stage, we wouldn't consider replanting for, at least not this year, and certainly maybe not for another year or two. Yeah. Wait and see. Yeah. So we're just gonna wait it out and see what happens with the dogwood, so. It's the Jeff and Rock Show tonight, the Jeff by the way. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so each week, we take a few minutes to check out what's happening in our garden. This week, Nebraska Extension educator Terry James shows us another fantastic All-America selection ornamental from the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to look at some of our new All-America selection winners and kind of see how they're doing in our garden this year. The first one we're going to look at the, is at Azenia Profusion Red. Profusion series has been really popular and I've really liked their, their series. Always less mildew on them, always bloom continuously, and a great pollinator um, plant for those pollinator um, insects. This one we sowed indoors in the greenhouse back in about March. It looks great. Uh, the flower is a fantastic Husker Red. It is about uh, 10 inches tall, so a little bit shorter than what they think that it's supposed to do. Um, very highly disease resistant, haven't seen anything on it so far this season, which as I said, the Profusion Series is known for. Uh, we transplanted it out, we planted it in a nice little group. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and see how our Profusion Red Xenia is doing this week. Love those zinnias and how they bloom all season long. That Profusion series is really disease resistant like mm -hmm. Terry talked about, so they're a fun one to try. And that Husker red color, it's a good we color can't beat to try. It. No, we can't beat it. So on to some more questions. Okay. So Jim, sand chafers in Wayne, what are they and what okay. do they do? Sand chafers are a beetle that looks very much like a Japanese beetle. And they usually develop in sandier soils, uh, root, uh, fibrous roots of lots of grassy plants and other plants in, in sandy soils. Hence, that's where they mostly are located. And uh, just like Japanese beetles, they're voracious. Uh, they don't seem to hit as many plants, but they love roses. And they're attracted to yellow, like white and yellow, um, sometimes laundry on the line, that kind of thing, it's all white. Uh, but uh, the best way to, to deal with them, of course, is to take hope. You know, they disappear after, uh, toward the end of July, they're gone. I mean, maybe mid to end, July, uh, end of July, they're gone. And uh, so there's hope there. The other thing to do is if they congregate, just like Japanese beetles, if they congregate on bushes or feeding on your valued roses or other ornamentals, take your soapy bucket, and they're so engaged, you know, with eating and mating that you just, you know, Put the branch over the 
the bucket and knock them down into that soapy water and it, it gives you a, f a feeling of well-being for one thing when that happens but <laughs> but of course you're, you're knocking down the numbers and if you just kind of keep up that practice you know every other day until it disappears that, that's really all you really, really need to do or two bricks two bricks I uh, like that keep too. your finger out of the way though yep yep <laughs> Okay, Rock, we have a viewer in southwest Nebraska, and they have a question about buffalo grass. They want it to spread to choke out the weeds. Um, they're having a little disagreement on the best way to do that. He thinks they need to mow um, and scatter the seeds. The wife believes it needs to spread by the roots or the stolons. So what's the best way to let that buffalo grass just In the interest happen? of keeping peace in the family, I'm going to say they're both right. <laughs> <laughs> Mowing to spread the seed. The seed you see above the surface that you cut off every time you mow is the male, and it's not going to reproduce. The female is down close to the ground, and if you really want to do anything with that you've got to scalp the buffalo grass to the soil and you're not going to do that but mowing does make it spread more so by you know and actually for the first for first year seeding we actually suggest you go as short as an inch and a half which we'd normally not recommend to get it to spread and then by the end of that first year you'll see that it's thickened up and done really 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 well um, so I'm going to say yes mow um, keep the mowing be aggressive and then you're not spreading a seed when you do it but you are increasing its spread so Kyle, <laughs> we have cucumbers that are doing fine and then all of a sudden they just started to collapse. No signs of insects or borers. They're wondering what it could potentially be or what they can do about it. Uh, it could be just um, a bacterial wilt or, um, or a fusarium wilt. Um, really any of those, any of those uh, pathogens that are, are affecting the root and the crown and especially if you were, if they had noticed those, um, the drastic changes right after um, one of those kind of couple of days of really hot temperatures that we had, then the plants just, they're not able to uptake any water and they'll just collapse on themselves. All righty, so nothing they can really not, do. Not a whole lot, unfortunately. All righty. So Jeff, uh, we have a viewer that they love their Canada red cherry, but they don't really like the suckers that it sends mm -hmm. up. And so they're just kind of wondering what they can do to control the suckers around that. Canada red cherry. That's really tough um, because they do aggressively, once they start suckering, uh, they do it very aggressively and it's really tough to control. So short of going in and cutting them back on a very regular basis, um, there's not a lot you can do. And, and I would almost suggest that if it's becoming too much for you that you just go ahead and remove the plant and start over, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And they're probably going to have to kill the root system. They're probably going to have to either hire someone to come in with a stump grinder and grind out a pretty large area because you're right, they can have a pretty extensive root system. Okay. Is it possible to have too much mulch compost in the garden? Is it possible? Sure, it's possible to have too much mulch or compost, so yes. <laughs> and what's a good ratio? We're not giving you that one. What's a good ratio? You know, if you're adding compost, I usually usually add maybe uh, two or three inches of compost that I'm incorporating at any one time, and maybe just an inch of mulch. In Lincoln, we have liatra spikes that are splitting and doubling. Um, what could be causing some of those on those gay feathers? Well, that's interesting. I don't know if they're having some fasciation. Maybe there's, there's some damage to the plant from either an insect or something. So I, I wouldn't worry about it. We have a St. Paul viewer whose tomatoes aren't blooming or setting fruit. What do they need to do? Well, I guess I want to make sure that our moisture is, is consistent. You know, you may have had some of these flooding rains. Make sure we have uh, some light mulch there and just be <coughs> patient. It's still a little early yet. Certain places, you know, haven't had, mine are just starting to set fruit here just in this last week. So. Be patient. The squirrels have taken all the Cornelian cherries. What does this viewer need to do to keep that from happening next year? You know, I have several at my house. Rock usually is over there eating them. Um, so, you know, what um, Dennis always tells us is harass them. So out there with the hose, I, I actually was out uh, earlier this week banging on our fence to get the squirrels out of mine because they're eating them green. I mean, they're not even close yet, so. Okay. So harass them. Harass them. I like it. So Kyle. Are you ready? I suppose. Okay, so <laughs> there is a huge number of fungi that keep coming up from old stumps. Is there any concerns from that fungi popping up? Uh, no, it's just gonna be a, a typical wood rot fungus and just enjoy the mushrooms. Uh, a lot of viewers, especially in York, still have powdery mildew on their nine bark. Is there any hope for this year? Uh, I wouldn't do anything with the powdery mildew. Um, probably just let it be and, and hope the next year is a little bit better. Maybe do some pruning to, to increase air movement through it. 
Okay. There's an evergreen euonymus. Um, it has what looks like a huge crown gall or rot. Um, do they need to keep it or should they go ahead and rogue it out? Uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's a big gall that's kind of on the main, main stem that's closer to the ground, I would probably go ahead and rogue it out. Go ahead and rogue it out. So we had a viewer that opened an ear of corn, finally, and they found gray and black distorted stuff on the kernels. What is it? Uh, it's probably smut. Um, uh, yeah, it's a delicacy in Mexico. If you want to go ahead and fry it up and eat it, it could be delicious. Purple dome asters lose all their leaves um, to a disease every year. Anything that they can do? Um, pass. Pass, okay. <laughs> we'll come back to that one. Rock, are you ready? Sure. So in Holdridge, a slip and slide was left on the turf for over two weeks. Will that turf come back? If it's bluegrass, there might be some rhizome regeneration. If it's fescue, it's probably toast, especially if it was during the heat of the summer. So what turf diseases are showing up in eastern Nebraska right now? Uh, brown patch, some ascochyta leaf blight, a little bit of dollar spot. In Broken Bow, what would be the timing for fall fescue seeding? In Broken Bow, probably mid-August. Mid, uh, a new crop of dandelions has appeared in Fairbury. Do they still need to wait to treat? I would wait to treat it. It's, it's, now you're going to injure a bunch of sensitive ornamentals. Let's not do it now. When would be the best time to treat? Uh, fall, usually after Labor Day. Buffalo grass is tillering onto sidewalks in Mitchell. Can they cut them off and root them? Sure. Is it recommended? Sure. <laughs> do I get two for that? I'm not in charge of the story. Yeah, your numbers are just flying there. Not should have eight. New sod went down yesterday in Kearney with 90 plus degree weather. They want to know how much to water. Um, they should probably be watering it multiple times during the day, just a light shringing. Hopefully the ground was moist before they put the sod down. The, most, the biggest bane of putting sod down is if, or the biggest problem is if the below ground is not wet or at least moist when you put it down, the new sod just gets the moisture sucked out of it and um, then it's toast. So hopefully the ground was moist when they put it down, but they should be hitting it a couple, three times a day with a short burst for the next week. And then uh, after that, probably once a day. And then after that, another week of that, um, that's this is way more than a minute, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> after that, they're gonna start uh, backing off like they would go over grab the sod pull up on it if it's rooted then you're ready to back off the irrigation I've just been informed that that's a new lightning round yeah record he uh, used up eight. my lightning round For it is eight <laughs> questions answered rock so that's why you got Jim's extra minute is because yeah. you're celebrating your eighth yeah. question I'll try so that. no happy dance no <laughs> okay <laughs> sure, sure, <laughs> okay sure. Jim sure we have a sure. North Platte uh, vineyard and what insects are ruining the wine if they get into that vat? Uh, probably the mo Asian multicolored lady beetle, so make sure that you're aware of it and try to keep it out of those vats. In Neely, every stone fruit has a worm in it. What can they do to avoid that next year? Uh, probably follow a uh, fruit, fruit uh, tree spray schedule. It's really important that you do that, not only for disease, but also for insect pests. In Nebraska City, the cicadas seem to be emerging early. Is that true? Really? Well, about a week before the first day of summer. Maybe they were a little bit earlier, but yeah, they were they're early this year. In Omaha, is there any way to control Japanese beetles and to keep them from returning? The answer is no. You just have to cope with them. That's the, the answer. There's a number of different ways of doing that, but cope with them. In Mullen, grasshoppers are out of control. They're over an inch long. What do they need to do? Well, you can go to, to insecticidal applications and check into that, um, but you're going to have to follow all the precautions on the labels, and if there's any harvest intervals, you got to follow that too as well. And white things that look like ivory soap flakes, but they jump on these trees in Wahoo. Oh, okay. Now, those are probably like plant hopper, um, nymphs, and they have a little bit of fuzzy stuff to protect them, to deceive any kind of predaceous insects, that kind of thing, and so they're no big deal. No big deal. I gave you that one because Rock took your minute. Yeah, thank you. Could yeah. I have one extra? Yeah. Yep. Okay, Jeff, what do we have over there for plant of the week? Well, we have actually three plants of the week here. Uh, quite the collection. So the tall one is this blue vervain, a native, uh, tolerant of a wide range of soils. Some might call it a weed, perhaps. 
I would, uh, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> As would I. <laughs> it's lovely in a pot. Yes. Um, the little kind of curly things here are solitary clematis, so it's a non-vining clematis. Um, kind of makes a nice little ground cover as well, so I, I enjoy it that way, and the seed heads are, are fun. Likes full sun to part shade, um, but seems to do a little bit better in the more sun it gets. And then we have uh, a seeded uh, coneflowers here, Cheyenne Spirit and Pow Wow Wild Berry. So they grew these from seed. Mm -hmm. They're awfully nice, kind of fun mm -hmm. colors. And I believe those are the All America selection as well. Are they? So. Okay. Very nice. Oh, yeah. Lots and they don't have any Aster Yellows. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> it is nice. <laughs> Give him time. Yes. <laughs> Jim. Well, that's what happens. It's... So anyway, so lovely, lovely collection of plants of the week and weed. And weed. <laughs> and weed. <laughs> I think they're all lovely. And now we're going to go into our next round of picture questions. Okay. So, Jim, we have a house plant. Um, it's been put outside on the French porch, and they've been noticing these holes, and it looks like it's been eaten. Um, they haven't seen anything really around it, and they were just wondering what insect that could potentially right. be causing some of that damage. Yeah, that's those are leafcutter bee uh, uh, marks. or <laughs> Leafcutter bees uh, like certain kinds of thick, sturdy uh, leaves, portions of leaves, to uh, partition their cells with uh, as they raise their brood. And so they're going to fly along, and then they cut out those little leafy disks and fly them back to the nest, and they just keep building a whole sequence of cells with pollen, their little egg, you know, of their larva, and a bee bread, you might say. And so um, being that leafcutter bees and a number of related ones like that uh, are, are important wild bee pollinators, it's important to be a little bit forgiving of that kind of a, of a thing that happens. Um, if you want to try to keep them from doing that in some a plant, house plant like that, you can just give it during the daytime, just go ahead and cover it until evening and then you can enjoy it in the e morning and evening hours. Or take it inside. Or take it inside. That works too. Yeah. Okay, Rock, we have a picture question for you, and the viewer from uh, Sweetwater has sent us this picture of their turf. It seems that the dead grass lines exactly follow their tire tracks. They're wondering what could be going on, um, if it's stress or if it could be something else. Um, actually, the viewer is really astute and don't recognize this came in the tire tracks. Uh, I'm guessing that they mowed when it was wet and hot, and that's wet wilt. Uh, very characteristic. If it was down in the lower reaches, I'd say it might be Pythium, but my, my suggestion is, is that's up on the slope. You can see that there's a slow piece of ground there. So that's what, well, it, even if it's fescue, it's going to recover because that doesn't crush the crown. It's just that the leaves got so saturated with water and then it was hot that the, the weight of the mower. Um, so, so next time, avoid mowing, you know, when the, when the ground is excessively wet and, and when it's, you know, the warmth, you can't really do anything about this time of year, but don't mow when it's wet. It's called wet wilt. Okay, but the turf will recover. Oh, sure. So, Okay, Kyle, there is a two-year-old flowering cherry tree. It had this problem last year, but not quite as bad. They're just wondering what could potentially be the problem with this and what some solutions might be so they don't have it happen again next year. It looks a lot like shot hole. Uh, shot hole can be caused by a couple of different things. There is a fungal pathogen that can cause shot hole as well as a bacterial pathogen. Um, there, Best control method will probably just be sanitation, and so make sure to pick up any of the leaves um, that fall. In the fall, that will reduce the inoculum that you have next year. If it is a high value tree and you are want, thinking about considering a treatment, um, you would want to make sure to, to know if it's a bacteria or a fungi that's causing that shot hole appearance. If it's a, fun, if it's a bacterial pathogen, a fungicide uh, spray is not going to cause, or not going to help you at all. So. Just figuring out just, what exactly it is, and yep, yeah, I would just uh, sanitation is probably your best bet as far as how to how to save it for next year. Sounds good. Okay, Jeff, a lot of Annabelle hydrangeas have been flopping and breaking all over. Oh what is going on? Well, um, you know, I think with Annabelle in particular, so this is hydrangea arborescence. Uh, which is kind of our native hydrangea. You see it in Missouri and those sorts of areas. People have a tendency to cut them to the ground. And so then we get a lot of that growth and so we get those big mop heads on there and they get a little rain on them and they lay down. So what, I, what we try to do on campus and, and some of the folks I've, I've been talking to here lately that have experienced this is 
in the spring, instead of cutting things so low, raise things up a little bit, maybe a foot to two feet. And in fact, I've been telling people, cut things at different heights. So you have kind of a different, um, different levels with that instead of all one. You know, one of the downsides to not cutting them back is, or cutting them back as far as the flower heads may be a little bit smaller. So that's why, you know, maybe mixing it up a little bit. And, you know, we'll do that with paniculata as well. So uh, limelight and some of those others, again, instead of cutting them all to the same height, varying the heights a little bit will give us some stiffer canes in there that will hold up some of the ones that aren't quite as rigid, so. So just change your practices. Yeah, right. Okay. So good, gar good gardeners know that every week we have some chores that we need to do to keep our garden well maintained. And one of those chores is pinching off spent flower blooms to encourage them to keep blooming. Here's Sarah Browning to tell us more. Deadheading is a special pruning technique we use on annual and perennial flowers. It helps keep our plants looking tidy in the garden as it removes the old flower heads as they start to fade. It also can help prevent flowers reseeding themselves in the garden especially if you're working with hybrid plants and you don't want the seedlings from the, the non-hybrid generations getting started in your garden. Some plants have ornamental seed heads, which we like to keep in the garden, like the tall sedums or the cone flowers. Uh, and we like to keep them around because they're a good food source for birds. One plant that definitely benefits from deadheading is, is the salvia. Um, here we've got a, a beautiful May night salvia, which is blooming, but it's, it's getting to the uh, point where it's past its main peak of the first spring flush of flowers. So what we can do are, are cut these flowers off to make our plant look nice and tidy and encourage the plant to develop a second flush of flower stems which will give us a nice flower display a little bit later in the summer. And if we do it all at once rather than pitching up, picking off each flower as it fades, it helps to coordinate that second flush of bloom. So again, it gives you more impact when they bloom the second time in the garden. There's three different ways that you can deadhead. If you have plants like uh, blanket flower or cone flowers that you want to deadhead, you can pick up those flower heads individually. But with a plant like this salvia that has many, many seed heads, we can either cut the stems back individually to new growing side shoots, or we can take a shear if you have a very large planting and you can shear the plants back, and that will be a, a big time saver. Since we have a fairly small plant here, we're gonna cut these plants back individually to make them look nice uh, until they send out that second flush of flowers. On this red valerian, you can all, the plant almost gives you the point where you can cut it back. Just look for the side shoots and cut that flower stem off right above those shoots. Other plants that respond well to deadheading include yarrow, delphinium, and campanula. So trim off those old flowers as they start to fade and your perennials will reward you with more flowers later in the summer. This practice is basically tricking those plants into making more flowers. And since the goal is to make more flowers and then we don't want those flowers to set seed, we wanna make sure we cut them mm -hmm. off before those mm -hmm. seeds are all ripe. So make sure that we continue to cut those seed heads off and then we'll have some more flowers to go from there. And then our last round of pictures, Jim. Okay. Okay. So we have a Ralston, Nebraska resident. Um, they found this spider on their doorbell, and they were just wondering what kind it could be. Uh, it's called a running crab spider, and normally out in nature you'll find it on the, the, the trunks of branches of trees on the bark because it has a tendency to blend in, and of course it kind of chases after any prey that comes in close proximity to it. That's its advantage. It runs very fast. So sometimes we'll see those in the house. That's a... That's a, a running crab spider, um, Philodromus vulgaris, if you'd like to know. All righty. Well, <laughs> Very thanks nice. Thanks for that one. Um, Rock, there's a Pine Lake viewer, and they want to know what this bright yellow stuff in the turf is, and is it a good alternative? Lotus to... Corniculata, if we're going to say that name. <laughs> <laughs> this is bird's foot trefoil, and it's often included in low-maintenance mixes along with the turf. I also see a fair amount of bindweed in that particular location. Uh, the beauty of um, bird's foot trefoil is that it's adapted to a wide range mm -hmm. of really poor soils, high acid, low acid. It's also a legume, so it fixes its own nitrogen, so it does blend well. The trouble is, is that uh, I think there's a 
multitude of states that have it on their noxious weed list. And it's all over Lincoln, and you see it, and mm -hmm. you can see how it spreads by seed and by runners. So it is fairly invasive, hence the reason that it's a noxious weed in a number of states. I actually like it in the in the lawn and really? yards, and, and we've done a fair amount of playing around with it just to see whether it would um, be better in certain mixes and haven't really found anything because it ends up dominating the stand. But if a person wanted to plant it, Amazon.com has seed, and you can buy it by the bucket. <laughs> okay. If you've got Prime, they ship for free, by the way. <laughs> So, Kyle, um, there is a Hastings viewer that has an ornamental pear tree, and it's starting to get this yellowish kind of color. The leaves are small, and they curl at the edges, and they just kind of wonder what's going on with their ornamental pear. Well, it kind of depends on how, how much of the tree is affected by it. Uh, if it's the whole tree that's getting this ye that yellowing, uh, it could be an iron deficiency, and you're start we're starting to see some of that iron chlorosis, especially when you have those bright, uh, those dark green veins on the leaves with the yellowing around that, that's a good sign of iron, of iron deficiencies. Um, otherwise, if it's just an individual branch, I would recommend just following that branch back to the main stem mm -hmm. and seeing if there's any sort of canker or if you can see some animal feeding or something like that that's preventing nutrients from flowing to the, to the rest of the foliage in the branch. All righty. So Jeff, we have an Omaha viewer. Um, they have a birch tree that um, has happened to snap off like it has in that picture mm -hmm. on one of the trunks. It's split about halfway down and it still provides a decent amount of shade. They realize that the trunk will not grow any taller, but they were hoping it would fill, enough, it fill in enough to look decent. They need to know, should they keep it? Should they prune it out? What, what would be the best way to do that? Well, right now, I think I would just clean that break up, just take that down to the next branch there and, and make a, a nice cut there. And I would have a, a slight angle at it so it's not a flat cut. And then not worry about it for now. Um, you know, keep an eye on that particular trunk. And if we start to see fruiting bodies or fungus growing on it or something like that, that later on would cause us to take the remainder of the trunk off. But right now, I say clean up the cut and um, go with it and you should be fine. All righty. And so now we've got time for our announcements. Um, the first announcement that we have is the Jesneriad Society. Um, they have their national convention and show and sale starting on July 8th. The information is on the screen for that one, along with an email address. This, the next one is the Plymouth PIA Flower and Art Show, again on Saturday, July 8th, in the Plymouth Community Building, with a contact on the screen. And then the last one we have is the Produce from the Heart. Donate your extra produce every Tuesday through September from 4.30 to 6.30 at the Backyard Farmer Garden. You can donate your extra produce. At this point in time, the Produce from the Heart, um, the Grow a Row donations have uh, 42 pounds total, and the Backyard Farmer Garden has donated 146 pounds total. If you need more information, you can go to producefromtheheart.org to find out more information on that Grow a Row and the Produce from the Heart. That's great. Yeah, that mm, that's good. really good that's to very have that nice. produce. So we're going to move on to our viewer questions. So um, this viewer has a tiny black bug at the base of the pumpkins down in the soil. And they've also picked off quite a few squash bugs. They were wondering what those tiny little black bugs could tiny potentially be. Tiny little black be. bugs accumulating low on the soil that they would, might possibly be uh, burrower bugs. They're small and shiny and black, and they like to feed on low foliage next to the ground, but occasionally they'll move up onto the plant. They don't cause any noticeable damage, you know, anything that I can think of. So just burrower bugs, kind of related to stink bugs. If you squish them, they'll smell like a stink bug. Okay. So, Rock, there's a viewer outside of Humphrey, and they live on an acre, and they want to seed their lawn for the first time, but they're not really sure how to do that. So they need to know when they need to kill it, um, what are some of the prep work steps that they need to do and what would be some good seed because they do not have irrigation? Sure, that's, uh, those are really good questions. Um, actually, I'm gonna suggest dormant seeding. When you don't have irrigation, dormant seeding actually occurs after the chance of germination in the fall is passed. But prior to that, and especially once you get into the fall, start spraying a non-selective herbicide or, or tilling real aggressively. If you till, you're gonna bring other weed seed to the surface, so I'm still gonna suggest the use of a non-selective herbicide. Burn it back 
two or three times um, going into the winter time. Um, then after the danger of germination goes, usually around Thanksgiving, plus or minus, then you spread the seed and incorporate lightly, lay down a light mulch with um, at least year old straw bells or something like that, so you don't track mud into the house if you have pets and that sort of stuff. And then just the natural spring rains and the winter snows recharge that soil moisture. So coming out in the spring, it'll start to pop and grow. So avoid any herbicide or any applications until you, you've mowed it two or three times and you should be good to go. We've had really good luck with dormant seeding of the tall fescues, the fine fescues. Okay. So Kyle, what diseases on tomatoes are starting to appear right now? And I think they're talking mainly the foliar ones. Mm -hmm. And then what are some things that they can do um, to help with those different diseases? Yeah, so right now we're seeing alternaria leaf blight, septoria leaf blight, um, and also, um, or, uh, so, so, sorry, leaf spot as well. Um, they're also seeing some early blight uh, occur as well. One of the things that I would do is, um, not a big fan of using fungicides in my garden if I can avoid it, and so just sanitation and avoiding overhead watering is one of the big, one of the big things that can be done. Um, just If you have any of those diseased leaves on the ground, pick them up, go ahead and compost them to, uh, to take care of things for next year as well. Okay. So Jeff, there's a viewer that had a number of plants in the yard that are affected by something that is making the leaves curl up very tightly. Um, they pulled out two tomato plants because their leaves curled so tightly they look like little balls. They've also mm. noticed it on blackberry bushes and pepper plants. Um, pepper plants, they were in a raised bed. Blackberry bushes are about 20 feet away in a separate area. They're just wondering, you know, what could potentially be going on in those areas. Well, it sounds like a growth regulator herbicide to me. I, mm -hmm. Anybody, any other ideas here? No, I think it's one of the auxins yeah. or yeah. benzoic acids, probably like dicamba or, and we're guessing at best and we don't know what's been sprayed in the area. So without a picture and, you know, I, I like to fill a leaf to see if it's been herbicide injured because sometimes it's something as simple as, as uh, aphids, right? But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the cupping that but they- But that is universal. Yeah, but what is but that? When it's universal like that, yeah. that implies that there was a chemical drift into there and mm -hmm. if they've sprayed recently or whatever, so um, it'd still be nice to get a sample in the hand and if you can fill fill it in your in your fingers and if it feels leathery that's generally an indication that one of the 2,4-D type herbicides has been sprayed and mm -hmm. and drifted in but once again this is not a you know a, it's a guest di diagnosis without something in front of us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need a sample to be 100% sure. Yeah. But our Even then we can't be 100% sure. Well, yeah. right. As, as but yeah, when you, a big area like this and multiple different kinds of plants that aren't necessarily related. All, all doing the same thing. Yeah. Yep. It's not all, they're all not gonna show drought stress at the same time because right. leaves cup when they're drought stressed. And, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. All righty. So Jim, this viewer from Wilbur has a pin oak tree that's about 20 years old. Um, it's irregularly shaped and has holes near the bottom of the trunk and they seem to be in a, in a nice neat line. Um, is there anything that they can do to potentially improve this tree or what could be causing that? Yeah, if the tree's in good health, um, this isn't really gonna have that much of an impact on it. I'm suspecting, you know, that they could be these clear-winged um, borers. There's one that resembles yellow jacket wasps, and it's called the red clear-wing uh, borer. And it comes out about uh, this time of year, from early July, maybe through until the early part of August, but it's an amazing insect in terms of mimicry. Um, Go ahead and if you see these holes, and sometimes if there's a little skin hanging out, you know, the pupil skin hanging out, that would be the critter, and they're perfectly round, and they're usually at the base. So go ahead and treat the base now with, uh, a, you know, an insecticide like bifenthrin, you know, the lower portion of the trunk, and usually that's all that's necessary because most of the time they're just located down there at the base of the trunk. Okay, so be on the lookout, guess. and again, yeah. we're And we're if you see one of them, they're fantastic looking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rock. Liquid grass is advertised in a spray bottle, about $20, and it'll cover about 50 square feet. Yay or nay? I'm gonna say that's really expensive, and I'm not sure what the liquid is, and anytime we see that, too good to be true. And we have some really good seed people in the in the state. Um, you know, in the eastern part, western part, you have seed companies that buy, sell you certified seed and you do a good agronomic and horticultural practices. You'll get a really good stand of turf that way, and you know, Bugs in a jug and grass in a, in you know I don't even understand what that means. I, it's 
you spray it out? I, I'm a little bit weirded out by this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going I'm to say that's a definitive no. That was not a speed round question, but uh, it, it's that much money for that small an area is is just ridiculous. You can you can buy 50 pounds of seed for under a hundred dollars, and you can seed you know 5,000 square feet, right? So mm -hmm. do the math. Okay. <laughs> so rocks were definitive pass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're all in agreement. <laughs> Pass. <laughs>